giant in Canada goose in Iowa. When once seen, its grandeur creates an impression on the mind which even the casual observer never forgets. As the clarion notes float downward on the still night air, who can resist the temptation to rush out of doors and peer into the darkness for a possible glimpse at the passing flock as the shadowy forms glide over our roofs on their long journey? Or even in daylight, what man so busy that he will not pause and look upward at the serried ranks of our grandest wild fowl, as their well-known honking notes announce their coming and their going? This is the giant Canada goose, a Canada goose subspecies. Biologists have named this magnificent bird Branta canadensis maxima. As the name maxima implies, this bird is a giant among waterfowl. It may weigh a third more than other types of Canada geese. The wingspan in adults may be six feet or more. The neck is long, sometimes almost snake-like. The feet and blunt bill are extremely large. Giant Canada geese often show a distinguishing light stripe or spot across the forehead between the eyes. Sometimes their white cheek patch seems to bulge or hook towards the back of the head. In addition, their breast feathers are generally lighter than those of other races of Canada geese. Ornithologist P.A. Taverner writing during the early part of this century, worried about the disappearance of the giant Canada goose. This fine bird, breeding on the prairies in the midst of cultivation, is particularly exposed to the destructive influence of civilization. And at the present rate of decrease, it will be but a few years before we speak of it as a prairie breeder in the past tense only. By 1934, R.P. Holland, writing to a friend, feared that this wonderful bird might be gone altogether. I was talking to an old gunner out in Saskatchewan this fall, and without a word from me, he said, we never see any of the big geese anymore. I guess they're all gone. I mean, the big gray fellows who weighed from 16 to 18 pounds. Giant Canada geese once nested throughout the central plains of what is now the United States and Canada. They were abundant in parts of Iowa in the early 1800s, but with the coming of settlers, their numbers were rapidly depleted. When the settlers first came to, to Iowa, when they first came to this rich prairie country, they found uh, giant Canada geese nesting on all these marshes, and they used them for eggs to eat, and, and they're young, and the adults for food, and continued drainage of wetlands in this area for agriculture, and the use of the young and for eggs for food finally depleted the population. Ingvald Gulickson tells of his father who homesteaded in Minnesota and his experience with the geese. In 1915, father stole away two goose eggs from a nest at Mud Lake. He placed the eggs under a setting hen and hatched two goslings. From this start, the flock grew to 30. Father became well acquainted with his flock and named each goose. His favorite was the gander dubbed Ole. Ole tipped the butcher scales at 18 pounds. Even though they were raised primarily for food and for feathers, used in pillows and bedding so essential in that frigid climate, father loved the geese. Soon after the turn of the century, wild, free-flying giant Canada geese were not seen in the Midwestern United States. 
For all practical purposes, the subspecies appeared to be extinct. But then in 1962, Illinois biologist Harold Hansen was surveying and measuring waterfowl for the Illinois Natural History Survey. He found some unusually large Canada geese in a flock in Rochester, Minnesota. Hansen compared these birds with records of the giant Canada goose and determined that they really were giant Canadas. Since then, domestic flocks of giant Canada geese have been found in other states, including Iowa. Several states in the Midwest have begun to reestablish wild, free-flying flocks of giant Canadas. Ancestry of many domestic barnyard flocks has been traced directly to wild stocks. To begin a restoration program, the Iowa Conservation Commission bought geese from goose raisers in Iowa and in surrounding states. A prime flock was located on Oscar Lutke's farm near Lotts Creek in Iowa. The story goes that in 1906, Lutke's brother traded a dog for six geese that had been taken from the wild in Palo Alto County. And from these six geese came Lutke's flock. Another goose raiser whose flock of giant Canadas has provided brood stock for the commission's restoration project is Chris Grabo of Boone. Grabo's geese can be traced back to Lutke's. You just like geese, is that Oh, it, yes, they're beautiful. They're beautiful. They're exciting to watch, and they're just like an SST. They're beautiful, too. What do you mean by that comparison? Well, when you see them come in and land, if you've ever seen pictures of SST land, why, they land the same principle. They get the head up and the neck turned down, and then they slide in and glide on the water. And it's hmm. just exciting to watch it. The Conservation Commission began its restoration project in 1964 with a flock of 16 breeding pairs at Ingham Lake in Emmett County. Since then, the project has grown to include seven areas of the state and hundreds of breeding pairs. The rich prairie marshland of northwest and north central Iowa was a major breeding ground of the giant Canada goose. The Conservation Commission began its restoration project in this area. Since most of Iowa's natural marshland has now been drained for row crops, it's necessary to provide refuges to maintain breeding flocks of geese in the state. The first step in rebuilding a wild population is to develop a captive breeding flock. Wings are clipped or pinioned in the initial flock, and the birds are allowed to breed and raise young in a large pen on the refuge. Giant Canada geese mate for life and return year after year to the nesting ground where they were hatched. So even though the adult breeding flock is wing clipped, most of the offspring are not. These free-flying young birds will leave the pens during migration but usually return to the same area each year, eventually to mate and increase the Iowa flock. The giant Canada goose, like all races of Canada geese, is hunted during fall goose seasons. The flock at Rice Lake, northwest of Mason City, is one of the newer flocks in Iowa. To build up a breeding population at sites like this, it's necessary to keep a portion of the flock on the refuge for a number of years and protect it from hunting. The only time we can catch these birds is in about uh, July when they go through a, what they call an eclipse molt or a total molt. And at that time of the year, they can't fly. And it's the same time that the young birds are coming into flight stage. And then we'll keep them in the pen for a while, and as their feathers start to grow, we'll handle them a couple of times and we'll clip them. And then we've got them, the ones we want. We don't keep them all, but we, we keep some of the old ones and then a few of the young ones. And this way, uh, there's no mortality at all on these geese, and they'll be ready to nest this spring when we let them go. During the winter, the wing-clipped birds are held in a small pen where they're fed, watered, and protected from predators. Every year, some free-flying birds remain with the captive flock. This bird here is, uh, I don't know how we caught him because he's, uh, mm. he can fly. You can see his wings oh, aren't yeah. clipped at all. Both wings are in good shape. Yeah. So he just happened to walk in with him this morning so he can yeah. read his band and let him go. In late winter or early spring, the clipped feathers are pulled out of some birds. This stimulates new feather growth so that the bird can fly in about six weeks. In this way, some birds that have been held over the winter can fly out of the breeding pen and raise young in the main refuge. I suppose that smarts a little bit, huh? Well, the, uh, actually the feathers are dead and they're in, they're in the wing probably about this far. 
You can see there's no blood or anything, and so actually there's no feeling to the goose other than the pull that we're putting on it. Now these are the primary flight feathers that we're working with. We're not pulling feathers just anywhere on the goose. They're right out here on the wing, and it's, uh, there's 10 primary feathers that uh, determine that the bird is going to fly or not. And so that's the 10 that, that we're taking care of here. Some of the birds are given neck collars. The wide plastic collars are color-coded and have numbers large enough so that the birds can be identified while flying and at a distance. Metal leg bands are placed on each bird. These bands carry a number and the address of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. If you look, whenever you get a bird band right on it, it says uh, to send it to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Washington, D.C. And they go to Patuxent, Maryland, where the bird banding laboratory is, and all bands are kept on record. There. All computerized. There. Sure. Yeah, it's all computerized. It only takes about five weeks to get it. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the free-flying giant Canadas that return to Iowa nesting grounds have spent the winter in central or southern Missouri. The geese may return to the nesting ground before the snow melts and before the ice goes off the lakes. This may be weeks before the geese actually begin to build nests and breed. Even so, soon after they arrive at the breeding ground, the breeding pairs will begin to establish what biologists call territories. A pair will select a certain area for nesting and defend it from the other geese. Often these territories will be the same for a pair of geese year after year. And so by the time that we put them down on the lake here, uh, the end of March, they'll be uh, very defensive and setting up territories. And their behavior in the pairs is that they bob their heads up and down and they keep other geese away from their mates. And so you can tell the pairs that way. They pair for life unless uh, something happens to one of the mates. Now, it's kind of an old wives' tale that they'll never remate, but that's not true. They'll, they'll locate another mate uh, within a year or two normally. They take uh, approximately three years before they'll actually nest. And so uh, at two years, they'll be, some of them will pair and actually nest, but three years, they're all nesting age or breeding age, we should say. Once the ice is off the lake and the snow is melted, the geese begin nesting. Giant Canadas may build nests on just about any small island or mass of debris near water. The tops of muskrat lodges used to be common nest sites in the Midwest. The Conservation Commission has constructed some small islands to increase nesting on refuges like Rice Lake. Commission biologists have also found that geese will readily use a variety of artificial nest structures. These nest boxes were made from oil drums. What I try to do when I put them on is I like to put them on a point of an island or an area that is a little bit sheltered from a northwest wind or something, and like to put it where there's a log or a big rock that sticks out where the gander can blow while she's uh, incubating during the time. They use them quite a bit. The ramps are, are the ones for the clip birds to get in. That's the only way they can get in is walk up the ramp and get in there. But now these wild birds, they just come in and they'll land right in it and, and fly off it. That's the only reason we have the ramps. Usually the gander is within 20 yards or so most of the time. And then when you come in close, he'll usually put his neck down low and, and slowly go away or maybe try to lead you away from the nest. To increase nesting, these boxes are provided for the captive flock inside the pen. They're also placed outside the pen in other areas of the Rice Lake Refuge. In addition, these nest boxes are used in some marshes outside the refuge to attract geese to outlying nesting areas. The nest itself is made of available loose material, such as dry grass or sticks. Hay or dry marsh grass is provided in the artificial nest boxes, but some of the geese seem to use these structures whether there's hay in them or not. The giant Canada goose will lay from three to eight eggs, usually five to six. Once the eggs are laid and incubation begins, the hen will pluck down feathers from her breast to line the nest and cover the eggs to keep them warm when she must leave the nest to feed. And then when we start to see down in the nest, that means it's real close to incubation time, and the hen has pulled that down out from the front of her uh, chest, and uh, of course that helps insulate the eggs and, and keep the temperature where they'll hatch. What just the hens incubate? Yeah, just the hens are all they're involved. What do the ganders do? In that well, the ganders period? stay real close by, and they're, they play an important role because they're involved in uh, keeping other uh, geese away that might try to bother or raccoons or dogs or anything that might show up. Even in nest boxes, brooding hens will usually first try to hide from intruders. But then, both the brooding hen and the gander may defend the nest vigorously. 
as we discovered when biologist Chuck Hall approached this nest box. Here the hen is the more aggressive of the pair. She makes several short threatening flights directly at Hall, just barely missing him. This continues as the biologist checks the number of eggs and their condition. Watch for a number of threat displays. Open bill, vocalization, outstretched neck, twisting and shaking the head. After Hall left, the hen did return to the nest. Giant Canada goose eggs are whitish and about twice the size of a chicken egg. Here you can see one compared to a mallard duck egg, which is about chicken egg size. It takes the goose eggs about 28 to 30 days to hatch. In a moment, we'll look at the goslings. Within a few hours after the last egg has hatched, the goslings are able to walk, swim, and feed themselves. When they hatch, the goslings are covered with yellow down, which they keep for about two to three weeks. Canada geese feed mostly on land. When the adults take the goslings onto land to feed, the young are particularly susceptible to predators. They're exposed to fewer predators on the water. The main defense tactic of the adults seems to be to hide themselves and their young in vegetation. Adults will lead or nudge the goslings into hiding. The parents will often swim with their necks extended straight out over the water. This tactic also helps to conceal them on land. Sometimes the geese will even submerge entirely, leaving only the head above water. By the time the goslings are a month old, their yellow down has been replaced by gray down. Family bonds among Canada geese are very strong. The young will remain with the parents through migrations and separate from them only after returning to the breeding grounds the next spring. Giant Canadas begin to look like adults as early as five or six weeks after they've hatched. These birds are about six weeks old. As you can see, they look a lot like their parents. The general color is the same. The cheek patch, which begins to appear early, is now distinct. 
and even though there's still some down visible in the feathers, the markings are distinctly those of a Canada goose. Mm -hmm. The young will generally be able to fly by mid-July to mid-August. As the young are growing their first flight feathers, adults are regrowing theirs, following a molt in July or August. Mm -hmm. This flightless time provides biologists with an opportunity for a yearly roundup for clipping some birds and for sexing and banding all the young. In mid to late July, there may be three to 400 birds on Rice Lake. Many of these are in the molt and unable to fly. But even those that have already regrown their flight feathers may not fly if they're not overly disturbed. At this time, several people walking around the shore and others maneuvering in boats slowly move the geese into the breeding pen and eventually into a working enclosure. Well, we've got the geese in the pen now and there's still one more roundup. We're gonna go down to the south end of the pen here and the fellows will slowly work the geese up along the fence and we've got a corral belt up in the far corner. The main thing is just to not to hurry them because most of these can't fly and the others that can, they kind of feel the security of those that are on the ground, so they'll stay with them, and if we're real slow, I think uh, we'll get the majority of them in there. Yeah, some of them are pretty leery, so they'll, they'll move way ahead of the others, and that's always a problem, mm -hmm. they kind of string out, but uh, again, they're just like sheep when they move. They're kind of checking their wings there. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, I hope we get most of them in there, otherwise we're gonna end up trying to catch them later with some other type of a trap, mm. probably. By early afternoon, about 300 geese were in the small working pen. As a bird is caught, its head is tucked under its wing. This calms the bird and makes it easier to handle. Any birds without leg bands are banded. Let's band it together. 71's a female. Okay. The Rice Lake flock is relatively new and small enough that it still requires this type of intensive management. But at older sites, like the Commission's first giant Canada goose project at Ingham Lake, which is near Esterville, the management problems are somewhat different. The Ingham Lake flock is now entirely free-flying. Around Ingham and nearby lakes, unlike other parts of the state, the state refuges include only the land up to the median high water line. Beyond that, in this part of Iowa, is privately owned agricultural land much of it in row crops that extend to the edge of the lake. Since there's little else available for the geese, who feed almost entirely on land, they may take advantage of patches of crops next to the lakes. This can be a problem in this part of Iowa, particularly during the spring and early summer. Maybe seven, eight, nine years ago when we first started getting them, I, uh, they were pretty to watch, and they still are pretty to watch in the spring, but uh, now uh, they've got to where they take us for about five, six, seven acres a year, you know, in cropland, and uh, they've got to be a real problem. The geese has got to stay, as far as I'm concerned. I, I don't have anything against wildlife as such. Uh, I think the solution would be either uh, uh, one of two things. Either the state has to uh, buy land to feed these geese on, or they should uh, come out with compensation for the farmers uh, directly around them. The geese were exterminated here before most people, you know, living in this area now were born. And uh, what we've done, we've uh, come in and reestablished the giant race of the Canada goose here. And it's difficult for some of the farmers to accept these geese. Uh, they accept uh, the damage from squirrels and raccoons and deer, but uh, the geese are something new and they think that we've created the problem. And what we've done, we've reestablished the giant race of the Canada goose in this area, much in the same manner that we've reestablished the beaver, uh, the wild turkey, the white-tailed deer. And uh, we definitely do have a problem, and we recognize the problem, and uh, we try to work with the farmers as much as possible. The way we've been handling it, and we have handled it in the past, is farmer contacts us we uh, attempt, to the best of our ability, to uh, scare them out of the area. We use a shotgun with uh, cracker shells, and the last couple of years we've had uh, propane noise-making guns. These problems occur in the Ingham Lake area in the spring and early summer when the young are flightless and the adults take them up on land to feed. In other areas of the state, where there is public land next to lakes, wildlife food patches can be provided and the geese will use them. 
At Rice Lake, several plots of alfalfa and corn are provided for geese. Much of the support for the Giant Canada Goose Restoration Project comes from hunters like Lowell Washburn, who's been hunting waterfowl in north central Iowa for 20 years. Right here. When I first started hunting, the chances of shooting a Canada goose in this county were about the same as the chances of bagging a bull elk. There just, there just weren't any geese around. What geese there was came down from Canada and they came through so fast that there wasn't any recreational opportunity out of them. With this Canada goose restoration, that's, they're, they're not easy to come by, but your chances are a lot better than they were even 10 years ago. But it's not for the hunter alone that this painstaking project has been undertaken. These magnificent birds have been reestablished in Iowa because they belong here. There are bound to be some problems with restoring wildlife in an agricultural state like Iowa. But solving these problems seems well worth the effort, and it enriches everyone's life to have the chance to see and hear these beautiful birds. At the beginning of this decade, when restoration projects like this one were still new, Arthur Hawkins of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service wrote, City folks as well as hunters find Canada geese fascinating. I first became aware of the ability of geese to attract attention at a football game. It was a Big Ten contest at Madison, Wisconsin. Suddenly over the packed stadium, a wedge of honkers appeared high against the sky. And their calling somehow penetrated the din of the crowd, and the attention of the spectators left the gridiron and was diverted upward to the geese. I don't remember who won the game, but I do recall vividly this small flock of geese and the impression it made on the crowd. Here is a species that was so sensitive to man's intrusion that it disappeared as a nesting bird with the advent of the earliest pioneers. Now, a century or more later, it has returned, hopefully to stay as a monument to man's ingenuity and appreciation of aesthetic as well as material values. Must get pretty noisy around here. Oh, it gets terribly noisy at times. <laughs> do they honk all night? Oh, yeah. There's always some noise out here. Hmm. I don't know what they talk about, but they got something going. Do you have any other, uh, the other types of Canada geese or just the giants? No, just giants. You just like them the best? Right, they're the prettiest and the best.